Hello, Professor Zhang. Can you hear me? Yes. How I are you today, me. Professor Zhang? Fine. I'm so glad to hear that. So today, um, let's just get to. Uh, so the time is your, Professor Zhang. Okay. Let me share the screen. Can you see it? Can yeah, we can hear a voice, Professor Zeng. Okay. Oh, oh. Well, uh, so I thank you are for, for the Umrah's invitation. I'm very pleased to uh, share the progress ideas. Uh, yeah. On the smart perception of marine ecosystem. So I have to change to not the the uh, I don't know what happens. Can you see the screen now? Uh, yes, Professor Zhang. Master, are you? So I, I increase uh, the size. Can you see it well? Yes. Yes, Professor Zhang. Okay, so sorry, I have to use this mode, not not the full screen. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. So, okay. So anyway, so the background is the uh, uh, UN decade ocean science for development. It calls for uh, the uh, smart perception of the marine ecosystem. And also the post the twenty twenty uh, global uh, biodiversity framework also requests smart. The our background is um, that over the development of oceanography, we can now uh, efficiently uh, measure physical and chemical environment. However, for marine life, we are still short of such tools. We are still uh, rely on simple uh, I mean, parameters like chlorophyll and several others. But technology is revolutionizing the study of organisms in their natural environment. So the smart perception of marine ecosystem primarily to use unmanned automatically observation to promote the additional labor intensive ecosystem observation and use anthropogenic uh, intelligence to uh, promote the big data analysis and to enhance our observations and studies objectivity, timeliness, and economy. Our vision is to conduct automatic and digital acquisition of the ecosystem data to support analysis and effective response. 
So our target is mainly focused on two aspects. One is category is marine megafauna, including cetaceans, dugongs, sea turtles, and big fishes. The other is focused on the forest ecosystem, like corals or seagrass beds or coral beds. Over the years, we have been working uh, with collaborators, including colleagues from Umra, set up the uh, framework for the smart passive consumer for marine megafauna. Uh, we uh, entitled it as WALA, uh, primarily uh, integrating multiple uh, disciplinary and uh, multiple approaches, including the watch, asking, listening, analysis, and response. In other words, integrating both uh, optic and a sonic uh, approach to assessing the ecosystem. And we also for the set up the uh, real time monitoring system for the underwater ecosystem, uh, you, including for the uh, coral reefs. In the bins, in the seabed, and we're also developing uh, the smart buoy to deploy in the subsurface or surface observation of the ecosystem. So the, this is uh, just, just uh, our, our review of the international progress. So this is the uh, uh, statistics of uh, telemetry with both uh, satellite and uh, uh, bioacoustic in the world. Uh, these are more uh, intensive uh, study in the Antarctic area. And this is the, the, the case for the both polar uh, region oceans. And this is for the, uh, the largest fish, the whale sharks. Uh, these two are for two other megafauna including the humpback hump, whale and also the uh, leatherback turtle. And there are more uh, in case for the uh, using bioacoustic symmetry for the uh, uh, blue whale and fin whales, and more on the uh, blue hand whales and also other multiple whale species. Uh, this is uh, we use the uh, uh, scientists using the camera for the fish biodiversity assessment and proved to be more effective than the traditional trolling method. And also more on the other fish species. Um, and this is another case for using the UAV to study the dolphins, uh, the behavior before they, uh, they are stranding, because the stranding of uh, uh, dolphins still is a mystery and a puzzle of the, the international society for decades. And these are new findings of these uh, emperor uh, penguins in the Antarctic uh, area through the satellite imagery. And these are more case for the surrounding of the whales, also use uh, satellite imagery. And these are uh, the, the, the application of the drone observation for sharks. And now we have more uh, platforms for the uh, observation, such as ROV, HUV, EUV, Glider, Argo. And the scientists are using USB and the sailboat to assist the uh, creel searching in the Antarctic Ocean. And also the DDA method is a very, uh, is a new, but very, I mean, uh, prominent uh, approach and a tool to study the, uh, the trees of life in the ecosystem. Uh, it has been shown that uh, the, uh, it, it's, uh, very, uh, I mean, permanent in the future uh, in a aquatic uh, system 
uh, if they're actually effective for the uh, uh, increase fish and other cryptic aquatic species. And recently, uh, UN decades has launched, endorsed a, a earlier action for UN EDA expeditions across the uh, UN, UNESCO heritage uh, marine sites. And uh, next, I, uh, I'll just uh, present some, some brief uh, review of our progress we made. Firstly, we have been uh, I may, uh, develop the uh, AI high throughput image analysis for animal targets for image generator study. And also, we uh, develop the high throughput audio analysis for statistician sound to assist our acoustic study. Uh, this is our, just our uh, the discover the sound raptors of the Lombardy dolphins that's living in our region. And from this figure, we can see that we can discriminate the Lombardy dolphin, the uh, whistles from the uh, dugong sounds uh, because their, their habitats are overlap in the, the same area. And this is the more detail of their sound we can clearly see that we can discriminate. And this is another case using their acoustic methods to promote our observation of the Solomon dolphins in the lagoon. And more using the acoustic study uh, to associate their with their behaviors. Uh, such as their response to the engine or the, the uh, boat chasing. And these are the, uh, our case, case uh, that we are using, uh, integrating the uh, sensor underwater and uh, uh, present a uh, steric uh, observation of the two of the yellow uh, dolphin. You can see the spot. Uh, these are our our application of the UN integration with the UAV uh, observation of the uh, famous purpose in the Yangtze River. And this is a more uh, of a result here from the cat use for the dugongs and the sea turtles because they both feed, uh, feed on the uh, seagrass. Essentially, they can all overlap. However, through our results, they can discriminate. This is a program, uh, population uh, profile uh, developed from the UAV imagery for drones. Uh, this is for the uh, uh, green turtles in two, in two areas. And this is the, uh, the, for the profile, population profile for the famous purpose in Qingdao, my city. And this is our just uh, behavior through the UAV behavior, showing that the uh, Elodi dolphins, uh, I mean, uh, school behavior. And this is uh, we use the uh, satellite telemetry to uh, review the migration uh, corridor, or the, uh, in other words, eco, uh, eco corridors for the Bruce whale, for the uh, hawks whale, green turtle. And this is their, their home range of the sea turtles and their uh, day and night behavior difference. And this is uh, the daily life cycle for the green turtle through the analysis of 
of the telemetry data. And uh, recently, we also found that uh, uh, what we used to think that the, the dolphins uh, potentially uh, compete with human for the uh, fish. However, through the uh, elemental analysis, we found that, in fact, the dolphins uh, could harmonize uh, I mean, living with dolphins in the same area because they hunting for different uh, fish species. Uh, this is uh, what we use the uh, eating method to reveal the mystery, mystery, uh, mystery of Blue Hill, the world uh, deepest Blue Hill in uh, the South China Sea, and also the uh, uh, water masses in the East Indian Ocean. And we also use the DNA approach uh, to reveal the biological connection across what we saw to be boundary between uh, management units. And now we are working on the uh, genomics of the uh, view and dolphins. And hopefully we, we will review uh, guidelines and uh, informative uh, on their evolution and uh, their uh, genetic basis for the adaptation to the environment. And this is uh, just uh, uh, what is uh, working in the, in the seawater in our in our, my hometown that the uh, we use the underwater video to uh, to uh, observe the uh, seagrass bed ecosystem in a real time and this is what we use the smart buoy to uh, successfully track the algal uh, tide paths and they are trained For the future study, uh, I would like to suggest uh, we uh, for, for the uh, concentrate on uh, first step is on um, coral reefs uh, using DNA, eDNA, and a non-invasive sampling approach to uh, probe their uh, distribution and assess the diversity uh, of reef biota. Use echo sounder on uh, you and boat to map the reef distribution and morphology and to detect fish protocols and use the smart moorings to monitor reef biodiversity reach, uh, bleaching and the recovery and the uh, soundscape of the coral reefs and the environmental forcing for the bleaching and stretches. Now what we uh, why we use this uh, well, uh, Because it is very difficult to sample the coral reefs, the biopath, and also uh, even it's uh, prohibited by regulations for sampling in the coral reefs uh, due to conservation. Uh, also, due to the same reason, uh, we suggest to study the megafauna using these approaches, uh, approaches such as eDNA and echo sounder because many of these uh, mega sounder make sounds and we can use, uh, hear, listen to them as I described previously and we can use the smart buoy to detect behavior of marine mammals and use satellite telemetry to reveal the eco corridors for marine mammals and sea turtles. Okay, so uh, that's my uh, presentation. Thank you, Professor. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Zhang, for that excellent presentation. Your presentation has been truly informative and inspiring, especially I personally learn uh, new knowledge about when you say that marine ecosystem actually has to do something with AI, which is artificial intelligence. It has a big impact on 
how we analyze the data. And I believe that it's not just me that uh, get the new knowledge from your presentation. I believe that all of the participants, all of the audience also learn something new today. Uh, I wanna say thank you to Professor Zhang for your time. I wanna say thank you for your presentation that are really informative and inspiring. And come to the end, thank you for your presentation and have a wonderful day, Professor Zhang. Thank you. Thank you for the audience. So now let's move to our second keynote speaker, which is Dr. Manuela Capello. Dr. Manuela Capello is a permanent researcher at the Institute de Recherche Paul Le Development IRD in St. France. Dr. Capello research interests focus on pelagic ecosystem and large, and large pelagic fish with a particular focus on, on the interaction between tropical tuna and their environment. Her work is helping to ensure the sustainable management of tuna fisheries and the, conversion, the conver, conservation of pelagic ecosystem around the world. Now, please join me welcoming Dr. Capello. Please confirm that uh, you can see my presentation, please. Hello, Chair. Can you hear me? Hello, Dr. Capello. How are you today? Good. Thank you very much. Can you see okay. uh, my screen? Yes. Okay. So I will uh, start my presentation. So. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting me uh, as a keynote speaker to this conference. So my name is uh, Manuela Capello. I, I'm a, a researcher at the French Research Institute for Sustainable Development. And uh, I work uh, in a research unit, which is called Marbec from France. So today I will uh, uh, talk about the sustainability of fat-based tropical tuna fisheries in the Indian Ocean. This is the outline of my talk. So first I will introduce uh, the topic on tropical tuna fisheries and fish aggregating devices or FEDs. And then I will uh, show you some of our uh, research actions concerning fundamental research and also uh, applied research. And I will end with a, a recent project uh, between IRD and BRIN on the sustainability of fat-based tuna fisheries in Indonesia and in the Indian Ocean. So uh, tuna is uh, among uh, the, the main commercial species uh, worldwide. Uh, the global catches have reached 5 million tons uh, in the last years. And uh, among uh, the major tuna species, 94% uh, of the catches are constituted by tropical tuna. And we have uh, three main uh, tropical tuna species. One is called skipjack tuna on the top right. Then uh, the second is yellowfin tuna and the third is big eye tuna. And uh, the habitat of tropical tuna is at the scale of the full ocean. And uh, tuna is found in all oceans. In particular, tropical tuna is found in tropical waters uh, worldwide. So it is a highly uh, migratory pelagic species. And because of this large habitat, uh, the management of tuna uh, is done at the level of the oceans. And uh, in particular, in the Indian Ocean, there is a, a tuna fisheries management organization, which is called IOTC, the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. And every year, uh, the IOTC uh, hosts uh, experts to uh, perform the stock assessment uh, to assess the, the health status of the populations of tropical tuna. 
And uh, so this is the, the status of the tropical tuna in the Indian Ocean based on the most recent assessments. Uh, the, the, the status is evaluated according to some reference points. Uh, we, uh, in, in the fishery science, we uh, consider as a reference point the MSY, the maximum sustainable yield, which is uh, the maximum amount of catches that can still uh, guarantee that the exploitation can be sustainable. And if you, if, if you see this color uh, scheme, we have that for skipjack tuna, the last assessment indicated that uh, the, the levels are uh, good. So the catch levels are still sustainable. It is still possible to catch the same amount of skipjack in the future without uh, negative impacts on the stock. Whereas for uh, yellowfin and big eye tuna, the current catch levels are unsustainable. So uh, the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission has established some uh, management measures that are con called TAC, the total allowable, allowable catches. So there are limits in the catches of these two species. And uh, the exploitation of tropical tuna, and now I, I'm focusing on these two species of concern, is complex because there are uh, multiple fishing gears that target uh, tropical tuna. And uh, in particular for big eye and yellowfin tuna, in the past, the major fishing gear was the long line. But in the recent year, uh, there were a high level of catches by the Persian uh, uh, per fisheries, uh, which are uh, represented here uh, in the graphs through uh, these violet curves. And uh, in the rest of my talk, I will focus on the Persian fisheries. For those which are not familiar, a Persianer is a, a fishing vessel which is encircling the, the tuna schools or tuna aggregations with a big net. And uh, so uh, in the recent year, but also historically, the catches of uh, the Persianers have occurred uh, around floating objects. And uh, nowadays, uh, they constitute really the, the big majority of the catches. And these floating objects are uh, mainly called uh, fish aggregating devices or FADs, F-A-D. So uh, what is a FAD or a fish aggregating device? Uh, a FAD is an artificial floating object, which is constructed and exploited by uh, the fishers to attract uh, the fish. We have basically two main categories of fats. Uh, drifting fats are uh, rafts that are used by industrial persinners, and in order to track them, they attach satellite linked buoys. And we have, on the other hand, anchored fats, which are buoys or rafts that are anchored on coastal areas, and they are mainly used by artisanal or semi industrial fishers. And so why, uh, why these floating objects? Uh, natural floating objects have uh, always constituted uh, a natural component of the pelagic species habitats. You have here images of uh, a log, a piece of tree, and uh, tropical tuna form uh, large aggregations around uh, floating objects. And the reason of this behavior are still uh, unknown. And uh, the use of floating objects by fishers dates uh, thousands of years. We have uh, some uh, uh, literature uh, uh, describing this kind of fishing technique that dates back from the poet, uh, Greek poet Opian. And uh, nowadays there is a massive deployment of floating objects by the fishers. We have uh, hundreds of, of thousands of floating objects in the, in the open ocean. And uh, therefore, the, the floating objects have become uh, an essential fishing tool, uh, particularly for the tropical tuna fisheries. And uh, why I said there is no uh, clear explanation why tuna associate with uh, fat or in most generally floating objects, but we have two main hypotheses. The first is the indicator log, and the second one is called the meeting point. So I will explain you these two hypotheses. Uh, the indicator log uh, posits that uh, logs, so the, these natural pieces of wood, 
uh, are used by tuna as an indicator of a rich zone. Uh, why? Because the logs can originate from river mounts and they concentrate in frontal uh, zones of shore. And both areas are uh, known for the, their high biological productivity. So they are like a proxy of a rich uh, zone and tuna would exploit them to find prey. And the second hypothesis is the meeting point hypothesis. So the idea is that uh, fats or floating objects are used by tuna to meet their congeners and form larger schools. So tuna, as you see in this slide, would arrive in small school and then would aggregate around that fat and would depart from the fat with a larger uh, school, which has several advantages uh, because being in a larger school can be uh, protect from uh, predators and uh, have a uh, higher facility to find prey. And uh, the use of fats uh, has several ecological impacts uh, that are of concern. Uh, the first is that uh, the catches on floating objects increase uh, the catchability of tuna and in particular the catchability of the juveniles of yellowfin and big eye tuna. So, that might impact uh, the sustainability of this fishery. The second impact is that uh, adding artificial floating objects can change the tuna habitat and uh, therefore impact the fitness of tuna uh, if tuna, uh, according to the indicator log hypothesis, associates the presence of a floating object with uh, a rich zone, that would not be true anymore uh, with artificial uh, fats. And then uh, the use of fats increase the bycatch, so the catch of uh, unwanted uh, non-target species, in particular vulner vulnerable species like pelagic sharks. It can also uh, create a de-entanglement of sharks if the fats are equipped with the nets, but now this is banned. And uh, also uh, fats are, are a source of marine pollution when they are lost at sea, and also they can cause damages on coral reef when they are beaching. So there is a need for a science-based advice for the sustainable management of fats. And uh, our research objectives uh, try to answer uh, first uh, the knowledge gaps. So uh, we try to um, assess why, but also how tuna associate with the fats. And uh, there is an applied research which aims to provide uh, science-based advice for the sustainable fat fisheries. And uh, our approach is, uh, the, the idea is that uh, we use fats as scientific platforms. So we uh, instrument uh, fats with different uh, monitoring tools, uh, ranging from echo sounders to cameras to hydrophones. And the idea is to collect these multiple uh, data uh, to uh, characterize the tuna behavior. And this is the kind of data that we use. They range from electronic tagging data, so acoustic tags and pop-up archival tags, acoustic uh, both active and passive, and uh, fisheries dependent data from logbook and uh, observers data and also the, the knowledge of the fishers, which are among the, the main actors uh, that know very well uh, the behavior of the fish. And the, the methodology basically combines the, these different uh, data and uh, models. So let me show you some uh, research uh, results about the first objective. Uh, so how does tuna associate with the fats? Uh, among the main results uh, that we uh, obtained, uh, those that were uh, obtained from uh, acoustic tagging experiments. So in short, uh, acoustic tagging uh, allows to uh, measure the amount of time that a tag individual, so a, an individual which is equipped with a, an acoustic emitter, uh, is how much time they spend near the, nearby the fats and how much time they spend out of the fats between uh, two consecutive fat uh, aggregations. And from this data, uh, what we got is that uh, we could characterize the time tuna spends associated and they can stay at the same fat for several days and even several weeks. 
So in these box plots, you have the, the amount of time spent continuously in the same thread. And uh, these residence times uh, depend on the species and on the size. So for example, if you look at the green uh, box plot, you can see that uh, there's longer residence times for smaller tuna individuals. So we have here, for example, the two first box plots, the yellowfin tuna of 70 centimeter for length is spending less time than the yellowfin tuna of 50 centi centimeter for length. And also uh, the, the residency is species dependent. For example, the skipjack uh, on the right is staying less time at the fat, is spending less time at the fat than the yellowfin tuna. So uh, we have been uh, analyzing and comparing data collected in different fat arrays. In particular, in this paper, we compared uh, data collected in Hawaii, in the Maldives, and in Mauritius. And uh, the, the result is that when the fat density increase, uh, so the number of floating objects per unit uh, area uh, increases, the tuna spend less time associated with the same fat, and the time it takes to reach another fat is shorter. And globally, the amount of time spent by tuna within an array of fats increases with the density of fats. And uh, we, based on this data, we could model uh, the tuna uh, movements in a fat array. So you have here on the right uh, a cartoon of the di three different fats and the tuna movements. And fitting the, the, the model to the data, we could uh, uh, characterize this movement. And so we can now uh, model the tuna movement as a correlated random walk um, movement. And uh, at a given distance from the fat, the tuna is not moving randomly anymore, but it is orienting directly towards a fat. And this distance is quite large. It is between two to five uh, kilometers. And uh, let me show you some uh, application of this knowledge for uh, providing scientific advices. So uh, we, we, we recently published this concept paper um, where the idea is really to develop indicators and operating model to support the management of fats. In this case, it is, this paper is specific to the drifting fats. So there is a series of indicators, uh, both uh, uh, focusing on target and non-target species to assess the impacts of fats but also on the habitats, uh, which uh, can also be impacted by the fats. So let me show you an example of such indicator regarding the habitat. Uh, so this is a recent uh, paper uh, that was based on uh, observers' data uh, analysis. So you know the observers on board, uh, fishing vessel uh, can record every activity of the perceivers, including the encounter of a floating object and uh, the type of floating object. And using this data, we estimated the number of observed floating objects per day of observation. And uh, we divided that for three different categories, uh, marine litter, fats, and the natural floating objects. And you see on the right, on the top right, that uh, fats uh, are uh, the majority of floating objects, and uh, they have in increased uh, in time. So the, the time uh, scale is at the bottom uh, of, the, of the graph. And uh, there is an increase in the fat proportion, and uh, now they constitute more than 80% of the floating objects encountered uh, by, the fish, by the fishing vessels. And uh, this uh, habitat change, we uh, couple uh, this knowledge with uh, the correlated random walk model to uh, predict how uh, this change uh, in the number of floating objects have impacted the catchability uh, of uh, tropical tuna. So in, in this uh, graph in the center, you have the predicted fraction of associated tuna population for uh, the, the, the pristine situation where only uh, natural floating objects are present and uh, on, the, on the situation with the, with the pink uh, color 
where there are both fats and uh, natural floating objects. So the, the fraction of the associated population uh, moves from 20% to 68%. And uh, this increase uh, increases the catchability and therefore the, the vulnerability of the tropical tuna to uh, the persin uh, fishery. And we could quantify this uh, amount of uh, catchability uh, increase. And uh, this is uh, another uh, kind of uh, uh, modeling approach that we will uh, present uh, next week uh, to the Indian Ocean uh, Fed Working Group. So here we develop an age structure model uh, for uh, describing the population dynamics uh, of tuna and uh, to predict the effects of different fed management measures for the drifting feds. And, uh, the, I won't go into the detail, but we tested different uh, scenarios for fat management from a 50% reduction of the fat sets up to the total fat ban. And we could uh, project uh, how different uh, stock uh, characteristics, like uh, the, 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 the spawning biomass or the recruitment, would uh, change uh, depending on the different management uh, scenarios. And this will be discussed uh, next week. And uh, to, to conclude this part, uh, this is a, a study where we uh, also coupled uh, models from tagging uh, uh, pop-up tags and uh, observations, underwater observations. And we could quantify the, the, the mortality rates of sharks uh, due to the entanglement uh, under the nets of the fats. And uh, thanks to this study, uh, there were new, re new resolutions that uh, banned uh, the use of nets uh, in all the tuna uh, regional fishery man management organization. So now let's uh, uh, conclude with uh, Indonesia. So uh, Indonesia is a member of uh, IOTC in three different fisheries management uh, area. Uh, it is the second largest tropical tuna uh, producer in the Indian Ocean after uh, EU Spain. And uh, tuna is caught by uh, both industrial and uh, artisanal vessels. And uh, the Tuna fisheries in Indonesia use uh, anchored fats, which are called uh, rumpon. And uh, currently there is no uh, exact figures on the number of fats, but it is estimated that around five to 10,000 anchored fats are deployed in the Indonesian waters. And uh, there's still little knowledge on these uh, fat exploitation levels. And uh, also there were several regulations to manage fats that were not fully implemented. In uh, IOTC, uh, now there are new regulations uh, this year that require the management of anchored fats. So there is a need uh, in Indonesia for a science-based advice for the management of, of fats. And uh, so this, is, uh, this comes to the, the project, the uh, IRB, IRD Brin uh, Collaborative Project of which I am a principal investigator with Pak Budianto from Brin RCF. And the objective is to provide uh, new knowledge and uh, scientific advice for the sustainable management of fats in Indonesia and in the Indian Ocean, and also to provide capacity building uh, through research. So we have uh, different uh, activities that are planned and have uh, started. Uh, in 2023. Uh, some activities concern experiments on captive tuna in the brain facilities in Gondol in the north of Bali. We will study the physiology, uh, but also the bioacoustics of tuna. And uh, other activities uh, concern uh, field data, uh, the collection of uh, both fisheries dependent and independent uh, data. Uh, fishers knowledge, but also uh, passive and active acoustics. So the actions have started recently and there is more to come hopefully in the next years. And with this, I have finished. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm of course available for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Capola, for your presentation. That is really truly informative and inspiring for us. So now, 
We'll be taking questions from the audience. So, dear all of the audience, if you have questions, please your hand. Please raise your hand. Chair, if I may, there is a question on the on the chat. So, Dr. Capello, it seems like your presentation are really um, inspiring, are really inf informative for us. So, seems like no one to ask because it's really your presentation is really informative for us. So, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Capello, for your excellent presentation. I think we all learned a lot today. So, to summarize what uh, Dr. Capello's talk about the ecological condition that, that are actually have some condition. Oh, okay, so we got one audience to, who wants to ask you a question. Okay, good afternoon, Miss. Um, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Suchi Ramadani from the Faculty of Maritime Economics and Business. This is my question. What are the biggest challenges facing the, sus the sustainable management of tuna fisheries today? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. May I answer, Chair? Yeah, you can, you can answer directly, Dr. Capillo. Thank you. Uh, so that's a very wide question and uh, it deserves a lot of discussion. But yeah, there's uh, several challenges uh, today about uh, the management of tropical tuna fisheries. One, as I said, is attaining sustainable uh, levels of exploitation. So now we have currently two of the three uh, major tropical tuna species which are uh, overexploited. And so we should uh, come back to sustainable levels for these two species. Uh, the second is uh, also about uh, the, the management in terms of uh, the different gears and different countries. We have uh, uh, Tuna is a, like an international species uh, exploited by uh, different uh, countries. And uh, I think one of the challenges is uh, attaining this um, uh, international uh, agreement about how to share uh, the, 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 the catch uh, limits. So there are uh, several working groups uh, that discuss about uh, this. Once, uh, once the, the resource is uh, limited, then the, 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 the different uh, approaches to share uh, the same resource uh, become really a, a challenge.
Okay. So it seems like uh, there's another one want to ask you a question. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm Mirza Ayunda. I am a lecturer uh, under digital businesses. And my question is, how can we balance the need of conservation and the needs of coastal communities that rely on tuna fisheries for their livelihoods? Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, another very interesting question. And uh, I'm not sure I have the answer how to balance this uh, conservation uh, needs and uh, also the need uh, for the social, uh, social economic and also uh, um, food security needs for the, the social communities. Uh, I think we need to, to work uh, at an interdisciplinary uh, level, uh, not only uh, ecologists, marine ecologists, but also, and fishery scientists, but also uh, social scientists and uh, economic uh, experts to, to find a solution. I think uh, the, the answer will not come from one uh, discipline alone, but it is really a multidisciplinary approach that we should uh, undertake. Okay, thank you for sharing, Dr. Capello. Okay, Dr. Capello, it seems like uh, someone asking you through the uh, Zoom chat, you can check uh, through the chats on Zoom. Uh, so yeah, you yes. can answer so, it directly. Yes, so the question is whether uh, the aggregations of tuna uh, uh, occur also around macroplastic waste? And the answer is yes. Uh, the fishers uh, try to find every kind of floating objects, including uh, marine pollution. And uh, any kind of uh, floating object uh, doesn't make a difference for tuna. They, they associate uh, whatever the kind of ob object it is. So the, the waste is one of the the components of the of the floating object uh, environment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Coppola, for your answer. Thank you so much for your excellent presentation. I think we all learned a lot today. Um, I hope uh, I hope that uh, we all learned something new today and. Uh, we will be inspired to take action to help our, uh, to protect, to get to know about our marine ecosystems. Thank you very much, Chair and all the people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kapil, and have a wonderful day. Thank you, you too. So, um, first of all, I want to uh, thank the audience for your participation and for your interest to this important topic. And I hope that you have um, learned something new today. And I want to say, th say thank you for your time here, for your attention. And now I want to give it back the stage to the, our MC, Ms. Natasha. All right, our ladies and gentlemen, give a applause for our speakers and our moderator today. Now, we would like to announce the best speakers for each panel room. We start from the panel room one. The best speakers, panel room one, is Mr. Dr. Shofirman Sofyan. Give a applause. Okay, panel room two. The best speaker panel room two is Miss Dr. Atika Tahira.
Sorry, wait for a moment. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now we would like to announce the best speaker for each panel room. We start from the panel room one. The best speaker for panel room one is Mr. Dr. Shofirman Shofian. The best speaker for panel room two is Miss Dr. Atika Tahira. The best speaker for panel room three, Mr. Wahyudin, PhD. The best speaker for panel room four, Mr. Aksan, Aksan Sina Raka Shakti. The best speaker for panel room five, Mr. Dominkus Yuli Wilson Laila. The best speaker panel room six, Mr. Indra Martias. Okay, okay, okay. The best speaker panel room seven, Miss or Mrs. Hanifa Norfatina Purunito. And the last one, the best speaker panel room eight. Miss or Mrs. Nurul Hayati, give a plus. Who joined the Who the best speaker joined in this room? Please go on to the stage to take a picture for this memorable moment. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we move to the next agenda is closing remarks. For the first one, we kindly invite the chairman of the Third Pacific, Mr. Wahyudin, PhD. Time and place is yours. Hello, uh, everyone. Good afternoon. And I would like to say congratulations for the all participants, all speakers, and especially for all the best presenter for Pacific 2023. So uh, I would like to say we hope you enjoy attending our our event, our conference, as we enjoy the voting together. If you have concern after you. Uh, if you concern after you head out, please get thoughts with the speaker by email or anything, and let us know, know how to can help you to reach the speaker. We will send you the all uh, material about the speaker by our website, and we truly appreciate it serving you and cannot wait to see you to the together in the next year or the next Pacific. For my CPIC and 2000, probably 2024. So thank you for coming and see you next year. Thank you to Mr. Wahyudin, PhD. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the next is closing remarks and officially close of the third Maritime Continent Fulcrum International Conference 2023. We kindly invite the Rector of Universitas Maritim Raja Ali Haji, Professor Dr. Agung Damar Shakti. Time and place is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of the third Maritime Continent Fulcrum International Conference 2023, organized by Universitas Maritim Raja Ali Haji. Please give a big plus for us. All right, we would like to say thank you to all the COMIT presenters, all invited speakers, and all participants for this event. I'm Natasha Putri as a master ceremony. Thank you and see you in the Pacific next year. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Saya mengundang semua masih ada di ruangan ini untuk foto bersama panitia peserta presenter. Mari kita mengabadikan momen ini yang diadakan setahun sekali. Mari kita.